Dorothy Hyde. I can't. Oh. Oh, she said something about it. It's not you. I'm a human. That, that part was hard. Yeah. Why is this? Very seldom do you, does it get put to us that plainly. Yeah. We need help. Why won't you help us? Yeah. I'm, not I'm like, I will. Very, I will help you. very seldom does it get put that plainly. Yeah. Going, I'm so sorry. I just skipped out on you guys. Yeah. That's uh, <laughs> caught up in other stuff. Um, but, uh, okay. Yeah, nothing at all. I don't, I don't think we're going to have any concerns tonight. What did, what did you do? What's that? What did you do? I'm meeting with him and Javier about the... I skipped... Yeah, I skipped the, the conference. Okay. Part of that... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm really going to say that I ended up having just my mom. Do you want to do the clock wall? Oh, good. Clock wall. Yeah, I wanted to make it so it sits there when you went yeah, out. That's great. I'll try to do it. After I do mine, yeah. I'll come. Field you with you. Okay. And that you just. Sorry. Okay. Karen. Yeah. Hi there. Hi. Oh, it's open. I'm going to call this meeting of the Durham City Council to order for Monday, March the 19th, 2018 at 7 o'clock p.m. And we certainly want to welcome everyone who's here in attendance. Thank you so much for being here. And now could we please pause for a moment of silent meditation. Thank you. It's always nice when there's a baby during the silent meditation. <laughs> Makes you. Grounds, the whole thing does. Mm -hmm. it really gets us grounded. Yes, it does. Uh, and now I'm going to recognize Councilmember Reese to lead us in the pledge. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, everyone, for being with us tonight. Uh, if it is your practice to do so, and if you're able, please rise and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, under God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Mayor Shule. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Johnson. Here. Councilmember Alston. Here. Councilmember Caballero. Here. Councilmember Freeman. Present. Councilmember Middleton and Councilmember Reese. Here. Thank you. Councilmember Reese, do you have a motion regarding Councilmember Middleton? I do, Mr. Mayor. As you know, um, so this is for the uh, edification of the folks in the audience and at home. Uh, Councilmember Middleton had to travel out of state today uh, for a, a personal matter and has been stuck uh, out of town uh, with a broken airplane and will almost certainly not be here before the end of our meeting. And so for that reason, I would move that uh, we grant Councilmember Middleton an excused absence tonight. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we grant Councilmember Middleton an excused absence. Is there any discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. And now we'll move to our ceremonial items. And the first ceremonial item tonight is the neighbor spotlight. Uh, and we will be recognizing tonight as our neighbor spotlight, Constance Wright. Ms. Wright, are you here? Great. Please come up. And if there are friends or family that you would like to come up with you, please invite them. Good to see you. Congratulations. How are you? Great. Hey. Hey, how are you? Good to see you. 
So as you all know, uh, we give out a monthly neighborhood spotlight to amazing citizens doing amazing things. And this month's recognition for the month of March 2018 is presented to Constance Wright of Red Maple Park Community. I'm going to read a little bit about Ms. Wright. And then I'm going to let you say a few things. So get ready. Constance Wright is the recipient of the Neighbor Spotlight for the month of March 2018. The Neighbor Spotlight Award recognizes community members that have gone above and beyond in volunteering their time to serve the community. This month, Constance Wright, a resident of the Red Maple Park community, was nominated and selected because of the wonderful work she has done in her neighborhood, including, but not limited to, organizing neighborhood projects, including cleanups, events at the park, and the construction of a Kaboom playground. Starting the Neighborhood Watch and attending PAC2 meetings, sharing information with neighbors, and conducting outreach to support community activities. Congratulations, Mrs. Wright, on being the March Neighbor Spotlight for the City of Durham, and thank you for all the work you do to improve our Durham community. And we are just really happy to have you here tonight who congratulates you. And I'm going to give you this plaque and uh, let you say a few words. So, congratulations. Right on. It's an honor to receive this award. It was a surprise also um, when I was told that I was going to get it. I couldn't imagine who had nominated me. Well, it was my neighbor and friend, mm -hmm. and my she's always helping me, Pat James. Uh, I want to thank all the people in my community. I want to thank my family and my friends that uh, come out and support me when we do our cleanups, when we have our um, events in the park. Um, we do a lot of things around there. And I always have a lot of help when that goes on. So I just want to thank everybody for um, recognizing me. I, like I said, I'm surprised, but I'm honored all at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all. And if you haven't been to Red Maple Park lately, it's a different place than it was, thanks to Ms. Wright and people like her. It's an absolutely wonderful park in the city of Durham. All right. And now the second uh, ceremonial item t tonight that we have is uh, a proclamation uh, for the crop walk. And I'm going to ask my council colleague, Javiera Caballero to come and to uh, read this proclamation. And I'm going to ask Karen Haldeman, I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Karen, Karen Johansson to please come up and receive the, uh, receive the proclamation. Is there anyone else, Karen, who's with you? Yeah, I see, I see, oh, you have Spencer and Marge. Please come up. This is a very uh, active trio. Please come up. Javiera, here we go. Mm -hmm. Whereas at the end of World War II, American citizens wanted to share our country's abundance with European war, war victims, and crops' first purpose was to gather wheat and other crops from U.S. farms and send, Europe, send to Europe on friendships. And whereas today, the Durham Crop Hunger Walk is an important part of community life, bringing together people of different faiths, different socioeconomic levels, diverse cultures, and all age groups to provide local and international hunger aid. And whereas in the last 43 years, Durham Crop Hunger Walks have raised over four million to help and bring hope to hungry people in need around the world and here in the US. And whereas the Durham Crop Hunger Walk has awarded more than one million to local agencies, including Meals on Wheels, Urban Ministries, Housing for New Hope, Double Bucks for SNAP, Threshold Clubhouse, Food Bank of Central and Eastern North Carolina, Families Moving Forward, Open Tables, Partners for Youth Opportunity, St. Andrew's Society, Changing a Generation Outreach, and Mount Cavalry UCC Food Pantry, who provide food to our Durham neighbors in need, and whereas the Durham Crop Hunger Walk raised 153,900 last year, and whereas the 2018 Durham Crop Hunger Walk will be dedicated to the memory of friend of the walk, Baba Chuck Davis, and whereas the Durham Crop Hunger Walk in 2018 will dedicate all of the internationally designed funds, excuse me, designated funds, 
over what was raised last year to the Safe School Zone program in Kenya in memory of Chuck Davis and where as a drop Durham Crop Hunger Walk is the oldest fundraising walk in NC and will hold its 44th annual Crop Hunger Walk on Sunday, March 25th. And whereas the Durham Crop Hunger Walk helps the community become aware of hunger and its causes and allows them to take action, action help end. And whereas the Durham Crop Hunger Walk remains the second largest crop walk in the nation out of more than 1,000 walks demonstrating the tremendous compassion and altruism of Durham citizens and whereas Durham Crop Walk successfully raises funds to help stop hunger one step at a time. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shul, mayor of the city of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim March 25th, 2018 as D Durham Crop Hunger Walk Day in Durham and hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance, witness my hand and the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this 19th day of March, 2018. All right, thank you, Councilwoman Javiera and uh, Mayor, Councilman, and staff. Um, I really appreciate your having us here. Um, I don't want to repeat all the things that she just said, but I do want to draw attention to a couple of them. Um, one is that we are now the second largest walk in the country. We've held that for two years in a row now. We're gaining on Charlotte, which has been number one for 35 out of 40 years that they were, they've been walking. <laughs> So this is going to be our year. So with our special designation, we think we can do it, so we really need everybody's support to move into number one. Um, our theme of our walk this year is peace, love, and respect for everyone. And some of you may recognize that. Um, that's the call out that Chuck Davis uses or used in his, at the end of his dance routines. And um, so because we dedicated the walk to Chuck this year, <coughs> Um, we wanted to use that as our theme for the walk because we thought it was fitting. Um, I have brought, we have t-shirts here for um, the council member and staff up here. Um, this was designed by an NCCU art student as part of one of their... Um, one of the, their, their class has them design logos as part of the class assignment every year. So we get some really awesome shirts. They put a lot of work into this. We had 25 amazing logos to choose from. And you could tell they really did the work. So um, I'm going to have Marge and Spencer will start handing out shirts. Um, so again, um, the walk is on March 25th. It's Sunday, Palm Sunday. You can bring your palms if you want. Um, but I would like to invite all of you to come and uh, meet us at uh, Duke Chapel. Thank you very much, Karin. Excellent job. Excited about going into first place on the walk. What do we have to do in order to do that? Raise more money. How much <laughs> more? <laughs> what do we got to do? What's our target? Um, our target is 200,000. Okay, 200,000. Yep. Okay. So we're, we can do it. That's I awesome. I know we can. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here. Really appreciate it. It's wonderful work. Here's the logo, if you haven't seen it, beautiful. All right, and, and finally, uh, we will be memorializing now uh, Dr. Dorothy Irene Height, and I'm going to call up uh, Joyce Scarborough, president of the Durham section of the National Council of Negro Women, and I believe that she has some people with her who would uh, also like to join her here. Would you all like to come up? Please do. Do you all notice that... Mayor Pro Tem Emeritus Cora Cole McFadden is in the house. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. All righty, Ms. Scarborough, I'm going to read and then I'm going to give you an opportunity to say a few words. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Whereas Dr. Dr. Dorothy Irene Height, a native of Richmond, Virginia, was born on March 24, 1912. And whereas Dr. Height was a leader in addressing the rights of both women and African Americans as the president of the National Council of Negro Women. 
<clears throat> excuse me, and whereas Dr. Hyde, after working for a while as a social worker, joined the staff of the Harlem YWCA in 1937, and whereas Dr. Hyde had a life-changing encounter not long after starting there, when she met educator and founder of the National Council of Negro M Women, Mary McLeod Bethune, and the U.S. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, who came to visit her facility, and whereas Dr. Height directed the integration of all YWCA centers in 1946, and established its Center for Racial Justice in 1965, and whereas in 1957, Dr. Height became president of the National Council of Negro Women, and through the center and the council, she became one of the leading figures of the civil rights movement, and whereas Dr. Height worked with the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., A. Philip Randolph, Roy Wilkins, Whitney Young, John Lewis, and James Farmer, sometimes called the big six of the civil rights movement, on different campaigns and initiatives. And whereas, in 1963, Dr. Height was one of the organizers of the famed March on Washington and stood close to, Dr. to Martin Luther King Jr. when he delivered his I Have a Dream speech. And whereas, Dr. Height, despite her skills as a speaker and a leader, was not invited to talk that day. She later wrote that the March on Washington had been an eye-opening experience for her. Her male, her male counterparts, and this is a quote, we're happy to include women in the human family, but there was no question as to who headed the household, according to the Los Angeles Times. And whereas Dr. Height joined in the fight for women's rights, and in 1971 helped found the National Women's Political Caucus with Gloria Steinem, Betty Friedan, and Shirley Chisholm. And whereas in 1994, President Bill Clinton awarded her the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And whereas in 2004, President George W. Bush gave Dr. Height the Congressional Gold Medal, and whereas the first African-American president of the United States, Barack Obama, who she befriended, according to the New York Times, called her the godmother of the civil rights movement. And whereas on February 1, 2017, the United States Postal Service kicked off Black History Month with the issuance of the Dorothy Heights forever stamp, honoring her civil rights legacy. Now, therefore, I, Stephen M. Shul, mayor of the city of Durham, North Carolina, do proclaim the 24th of March, 2018, as Dr. Dorothy Irene Height Day in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance and to commemorate her 106th birthday, honoring the memory of her humility, grace, brilliance, dedication, and passion for women, especially those of African descent, their families and communities, as we continue to observe Women's History Month. Witness my hand in the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this 19th day of March, 2018. Would you like to say a few words? Good evening. Again, I'm Joyce Scarborough. I'm the president of the Durham section of NCNW, and we are so happy to be here with you today. I have some of my sisters standing here for support. Cora Cole McFadden is our vice president. I just want to thank Mayor Shule for allowing us to be here and for honoring Dorothy Hype. I would also thank all of you for having us in your community. We will continue to support you, and we will ask you to come on out, and when we have an event, please join us. We will let you know and come to our meetings. We accept women, men, and children. <laughs> thank we you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Ms. Scarborough, you think you could get Miss um, Cole McFadden, one of those cool purple sashes. <laughs> Excuse me, Tom. All right. Uh, and now, are there any announcements by council? Any announcements by members of the council? All righty. Uh, and now we'll move to priority items. Are there, uh, I want to recognize the city manager for any priority items. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Good evening, everyone. Uh, the city manager's office has one priority item this evening related to agenda item number 14, which is the 2017 fourth quarter annual crime report presentation. Uh, this item will be deferred until the April 2nd, 2018 city council meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, do we need a motion on that, Mr. Attorney? You don't. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Attorney, any uh, priority items? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. Madam Clerk, any priority items? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No items. All right, thank you very much. And now we're going to uh, move to the consent agenda. 
Uh, the, the next order of business is the consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda can be approved by a single vote unless an item is removed by a member of the council or a member of the public for separate consideration at the end of the meeting tonight. And I'm going to be reading uh, each of the consent agenda items. <clears throat> Item 1, approval of City Council Minutes. Item 2, FY 2016-2018 Emergency Solutions Grant and City General Funds Housing for New Hope Subrecipient Contract Rapid Rehousing Project. Item 3, FY 2017-18 Second Quarter Financial Report. Report. Item 4, Resolution Authorizing the Negotiation of an Installment Finance Contract and Providing for Certain Other Related Matters. Item 5, Donation from Durham Arts Council to 12 Art Wrap Banners for Corcoran Garage. Item 6, Contra Six, contract with Public Ground Studio LLC for public art at downtown mixed-use parking at downtown mixed-use parking garage. Item seven, proposed conveyance of various property interests to the North Carolina Department of Transportation for the Dial Creek Bridge Replacement Project. Item eight, proposed sale of various property interests to BH-AG Durham Foster LLC. Item nine, agreement with Center for Documentary Studies to fund the Full Frame Documentary Film Festival. Item 10, agreement with American Dance Festival, Inc. to fund the cultural arts programs. Item 11, reimbursement agreement with Lenar Carolinas, LLC, Copley Farm Sewer Outfall. Item 14, this item can be found on the general business agenda, and that was the uh, priority item of the manager. <coughs> item 15 through 18, these items can be found on the general business as well. Uh, these are public hearing items. Uh, you have heard a, the consent agenda. Uh, can I hear a motion on the, these items, please? I move approval of the consent agenda. Second. Any discussion? It's been moved and seconded that we approve the consent agenda. Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much. Next on our, item, next on our agenda is the um, general business agenda public hearings. Um, and the first item is the public hearing on FY 18 19 budget and FY 2019 to 24 capital improvement plan. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Bertha Johnson, Director of Budget and Management Services. Um, this item is to receive public comments on the proposed FY 18 19 budget and 2019 24 capital improvement plan. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. You've heard the report from staff. Uh, I will declare the uh, public hearing to be open and will first entertain any questions for staff from members of the council or any comments. Council members? All right, and now we'll move to the citizen comment. I have here six people who have signed up to speak. Let me just say now, if you have not signed up to speak on this item, this budget hearing, and you would like to sign up to speak, <coughs> Uh, please make your way over here to the table in front of the clerk's office, get one of these yellow cards, and fill it out, okay? So just wanting to let you know that if you have not signed up, please do so. I'm going to read the names of the people who have signed up to speak, and if you would, if you would just come over here to my right uh, over near this podium in the order in which I call you, uh, that would be great. So first we have Daryl Brunson. Second we have Romy Gaddy. Third we have Donald Quick. Fourth, we have Monica Byrne. Fifth, we have Ashley Melzer. And sixth, we have Monet Marshall. Is there anyone else who believes that they have signed up and that I did not call their name? Okay, great. All righty. Uh, you have three minutes. Each person has three minutes to speak. Uh, please start by stating your name and address. And we're very, very glad to have everyone here tonight to comment on this, on this budget and the capital improvement plan. Daryl Brunson. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor Shule, City Manager Barnfield, City Council, Durham residents, and City of Durham employees. Again, my name is Daryl Brunson. I am equipment operator in the Solid Waste Services and have been working there for 12 years and a steward of the City um, Workers Union, UE150. As you know, this month, marks the 50th anniversary of Memphis Sanitation Workers' Strike in March 1968. Dr. King responded <clears throat> to support the workers' demands and address the dangerous working conditions, low wages, and lack of union rights, some of which we are still um, <coughs> dealing with 
as city workers in North Carolina. Tonight, we wish to honor these work, those workers and also Dr. King who paid the ultimate sacrifice when he was assassinated on April 4th, 1968. On behalf of the UE 150, we are here to present our 1819 budget proposal. These suggestions are the results of ongoing continuous discussions with workers across the city and ongoing frustrations of your frontline employees and even some management. The consistent rise of healthcare costs, the cost of living, <clears throat> stagnated wage increases, favoritism, and even current grievance procedures are just a few of the solutions that we will be providing tonight. We appreciate those of you that have found the time to meet with us over the last few months and years. We will also request a continued relationship with meetings with each one of you quarterly. This will hold everyone accountable to make sure that the city of Durham is showing more appreciation for its frontline employees and not just upper management. Durham is only as good at its, as an employees, residents, and local businesses and partners. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brunson. <laughs> Ronnie Gaddy. Thank you, Council and City Manager and Mayor. I'm talking about tonight, replace our day's equipment. I'm currently an employee in water management. Now, I've been there over five years. In that five year period, we do like clean the sewers. We only bought one truck, and the other trucks are over five years old. Now, in order for us to do our uh, duties efficient, we need equipment. Just as of today, the same, this truck I'm talking about, last year I had driven that truck and it would barely go for 25 miles per hour. I contacted my supervisor and told them that. They put the truck in the shop, said they fixed it. I got it back. It was doing the same thing. So they done it again this year, doing the same thing. And we was on a job site today, and the truck, we had to sit there for 20 minutes because the truck went off break, right? And you know, see the city used to replace the trucks after five years. They don't do that no more. Some trucks, like I said, over 12 years old. Cause the, I believe the truck I was a day was an 03 model. He was eight, 18. Now if you run something every day for eight, eight, nine, 12 hours a day sometimes, it won't last for years and years. But if you say anything about it, your supervisor will say something like, you know, it's a pilot error or something like that. How can there be a pilot error when it's like just old? You know, you know, the city needs to conduct a conference hence a study on that survey on their fleet. Because I've seen some trucks, they wasn't even the water management trucks they were using. It was public works. I mean, the trucks are so badly worn out. That, I mean, a dump truck, the bed, when it's raised up, you can see the sky. That's how it is, it's just eating up from the bottom because holding all this salt and sand, that would eat a body up. And uh, thank you for letting me speak and listening, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for raising those important issues. Thank you, Mr. Gaddy. Mr. Good Gaddy. evening, uh, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. City Manager, Council. Uh, my name is Donald Quick, I'm a steward. City of Durham Workers Union, Chapter UE 150, Public Works Department, City of Durham. Uh, tonight, we speak about the proposals making regarding the wages and our benefits. Uh, right now, 
what we're requesting is $2,500 raise across the board for everybody. This marriage system that y'all seem to have us under is not working because, you know, they, they called it the pay for performance. But when we come to work and do our job and we do it diligently, I mean, that's our performance. They see our performance. You know, I mean, y'all seen that when the snow came. You know, I know the police and the fire, they get theirs, but they talk about the first responders. Now, we was the first responders because when that snow started falling and we started cleaning it up, a lot of citizens, it didn't take them long to get where they needed to go. So, you know, I think y'all really need to take that into consideration that public works got out there and got it done. And a lot of people was very, very satisfied with the work we was doing. Not to mention we did have a few incidents, dings or dangs, but you know, for the most part, we got it done. Also, uh, <clears throat> the healthcare, we deserve, you know, we don't deserve to have to pay more in the healthcare. You know, I mean, we paying enough now. And then I just found out that they are switching from one to another. Also, we are asking that uh, <clears throat> all workers, including part-time, temporary workers, should be included in the $15 an hour, you know, uh, the schedule this year. All of them should be paid because if you see the taxes going up, food is going up, gas, uh, you know, we just want to make a living wage. That's what we want. That's what we're here for. That's what we're fighting for. But it seemed like to me, like I say, when it comes to the police and fire, they get theirs. But when it comes to the first responders, it seemed like the first responders sometimes be forgot about. So I hope that y'all would take that into consideration, knowing that public works are the real first responders. And also uh, the guys in water and sewer, you know, like I said before, when these main line breaks, you know, they the first responders. They the first ones to get out there and get it done. So I thank you for letting me speak, and I, you know, pray that y'all take this into consideration. That you know, the first responders are really, you know, public works. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Quick. <laughs> Appreciate all those comments very much. Hello. Ms. Byrne. We have a. Yeah. Could be with the clerk. Hello, and thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure and honor um, to address the council and to address the mayor. My name is Monica Byrne. 12 years ago, I moved to Durham because of its affordability and its incredibly <coughs> rich independent art scene. Today, I'm a full-time novelist, playwright, performer, and activist. Independent artists like me have played an essential role in making Durham a place where people love to live. Now it's becoming unaffordable like me, un unaffordable for me, and for all the independent artists I know, both as a place to live and as a place to make work. Of course, that is the case for a lot of Durham residents, as the previous speakers demonstrated. I want to stress that artists are no more inherently special than any other kind of worker, but because we are treated as such, that means there are a few crucial points I'm asking the council to consider when building a new budget. Number one, that in all private and public sectors, including the city of Durham, because art is treated as a hobby and not as work, artists are vastly undercompensated to the point of no compensation at all. Two, that compensation for artists is an intersectional economic justice issue. Art is something all people of every age, race, gender, socioeconomic class, nationality, and ethnicity do to make meaning out of and in their lives. But only some kinds of art are recognized and compensated by our institutions. That art is overwhelmingly made for white men, made by white men for white audiences. Three, that the city's arts funding as reflected in the current budget, overwhelmingly prioritizes institutional and corporate art at the direct cost of independent artists in Durham. Four, 
that the commitments to institutional and corporate art must be balanced by an equal commitment to the independent artists who make our city a place people love to live. The good news is that it would take very little for the council to start making meaningful change. I'm asking for three very simple things. One, treat individual artists and small arts organizations as businesses. That is, offer them the same access to capital and low interest loans that any other business might have. Two, set an example by providing for compensation for all artists hired by the city, at least at a living wage. If you have questions, hire artists as consultants at a professional wage. Three, please do not confuse funding the Durham Arts Council with funding artists. They are not the same thing. The ways in which the leadership and the board of the Durham Arts Council fail to meet the needs of independent artists in Durham would take much longer than three minutes to explain. If you would like to talk about that more or anything else I've mentioned, please get in touch with me or my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Byrne. <laughs> Ashley Melzer. Thank you, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Ashley Melzer, and I, Monica asked me to be here partially because we thought maybe artists had never come to speak to you before and tell you about what our lives are like. Uh, I'm a filmmaker, writer, photographer, and improv comedian, and in 2016, I founded Meddlesome, a 2017 Indie Arts Award-winning organization that produces improv sketch storytelling, mainly in Durham. Um, I'm an artist who makes my living mainly through doing art. Uh, in 2017, I believe we did something like 79 shows, and I would say around 60 of those uh, were in Durham, and uh, no one in our organization makes even a part-time wage off of our work, and all of our shows are roughly 5 to $15. Um, I moved to this area to study folklore, or the artistic communication of everyday life. I think uh, without much thought, we can agree that art is something everyone can participate in and everyone values. Importantly, when thinking about communities and governments, governance, art is important because it engenders connection. Love. We know that when children are loved, they thrive. So why wouldn't we take that into consideration when governing our cities? Recent research on the way emotional attachment to cities drives engagement was done by the Knight Foundation and Gallup in their Soul of the Community study. They interviewed 43,000 people in 26 communities and came to the conclusion that the drivers of attachment were three things. One, social offerings, two, aesthetics, and three, openness. People who love their cities don't love them because the cities filled the potholes. They loved them because of arts events, public arts, and parks. I think Mrs. Wright gets it, <laughs> uh, cleaning up that park. Um, uh, more relevant to your bottom line, the Knight Foundation found in their survey that cities with the highest levels of resident love and passion uh, also had the highest rates of GDP growth over time. Similarly, similarly, Peter Kageyama, an author and senior fellow with the Alliance for Innovation, who incidentally spoke to the city of Raleigh leaders last year and to, at the Innovate Raleigh Summit, um, he travels the country touting this idea that cities with the most emotional attachment have the highest GDP and economic vitality. Being attached to your city, loving your city, helps your city grow. So how do we harness that? Part of Kageyama's argument starts with this question. How many of us have written a Wikipedia entry? Not that many. Well, I think 1% of users have written a Wikipedia entry. Uh, statisticians call this the power law distribution. Uh, sociologists call it participation inequality. And what that means is there are a small number of people who do a lot of work and then a lot, and the rest of us consume it. So one thing that we can do is increase the number of people doing the work, the number of people if we're using the soul of the city study, who create social events, uh, play with the aesthetics of our city, uh, and draw us into open spaces like parks. We can increase our emotional attachment that way. And if we can make art easier by making art and making arts easier for people, then perhaps we can raise the GDP of Durham. Thank you. Thank you. Monet Marshall. Good evening, my name is Monet Marshall. Um, and I've been living in Durham for six years. I'm an artist and a creative consultant. And art and funding art work is an equity issue. As we know how Durham's demographics are shifting, we know that many of the folks who are moving here are because of Durham's cool. I don't know if any of you have ever looked for a job in the arts field on like a one of those 
big software, please leave. Try to find a job, but I have. And in that, you will find pages of pages of medical jobs from Duke University first, because in every job description, they tout Durham's art and cultural scene as a reason to move here. You have to go through pages before you find a job that's actually related to an art scene, which is to say that our businesses, our companies, our they're using the arts as a reason to move here. So when we don't invest in that, we are stripping the things that make Durham what it is. But I say it's an equity issue because we know the folks who can afford to take time and be artists, the folks who don't have to work another job, the folks who can pay for materials and things like that, that often relates to privilege because it's, there's a particular risk in art. I feel very privileged that I had a family who supports me in my art, but I also have a mother who has an associate's, a bachelor's, and a master's in theater who has never called herself a professional artist because she can't afford to make art full time. We are losing resources, real ta tangible resources. And then when we fund the Durham Arts Council or institutions to support artists instead, a lot of times the trickle down of it is not actually happening. Or if it is, you have to know all the ins and outs, all the numbers. You have to have your 501c3. You have to know your demographic breakdown. You have to have all this information that becomes a barrier for folks to get resources, even for money that feels small for a grant of $3,000 or $2,000, which once you pay for materials and you think about time, I just did a show, and I think I averaged maybe 200 or 250 hours of work in the show, right? I, I, there's no way that I can, just from ticket sales or just from donations, like pay myself an adequate living wage, and then I can't then pass that on to the art, other artists I work with. And the artists I work with are predominantly artists of color. So that means if I don't have it, I can't also spend it. But if I'm a small business, if I can then access resources, I can then spend that money to other artists who are also small businesses. So I just want you to consider how our arts community is not just folks who can afford a gallery downtown. They're not just the folks who know how to work the system and get a public arts grant. They're also some of us who are working in our bedrooms and are creating art and putting it on the internet because we just need to create. And we are part of the reason why people think Durham is so cool and a great place to live. So I really hope you will consider us as you think about your budget. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Marshall. Mr. Mayor, one brief remark. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to, uh, for those last three speakers, um, let each, all three of you know uh, that the Durham Public Art Committee is accepting applications for members. Uh, for the next three weeks, applications are open. Um, the Public Art Committee is an advisory board uh, to the city council and city manager and um, works with our Office of Economic and Workforce Development um, uh, on matters relating to public art, and also reviews proposals for projects brought to it by the city administration and makes recommendations to the Cultural Advisory Board regarding project approvals. And it's um, uh, one of the places where the kinds of decisions that you're talking about are made. And so I wanted to bring that to your attention for you to take a look at it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Council Member Reese. Aaron B. Could you state your full name? Please? Sure, yes, uh, Aaron Bryant. Thank you. Uh, esteemed council people, Durham residents, lovers of freedom. Uh, my name is Aaron Bryant, and I'm a member of Black Youth Project 100, uh, which is an organization here in the city of Durham and across the country committed to radical freedom for all black people. Uh, but tonight I wanna talk about um, and support uh, the advance of participatory budgeting um, for the city of Durham. And I want to give three reasons for that. Uh, the first reason is because democracy... Mr. Mr. Brandt? Yes, sir. Could you stand just a little farther from the oh, microphone? Yes. I'm having a hard time hearing you. Yes. Thank you. Can I start over? Uh, no, you're good. Okay, great. Uh, the first reason is because democracy is justice. Uh, we know that inside the borders of the United States, there is an increasing imposition of right-wing authoritarian rule. And last year's election here in the city of Durham is proof that when people come together and make decisions about the way society ought to be organized, good things happen. We have to have faith in the people, and this is the first reason why we should support participatory budgeting. The second reason is because money is powerful. Money's not power, people are power. 
but money is a particular way that you can organize society and put people at the front of your program. Durham can depend on the people. And the third reason is because participatory budgeting is an example of courage in the face of fear. History, both in the city of Durham and across the United States, show that history is not just progress, it's also regress. It's advancement and defeat. History is struggle. Courage is a virtue that allows us to take action in the face of uncertainty. It takes courage for people to come together and make decisions about society. It takes courage to invest in those people. And it takes courage to make the world a better place. Participatory budgeting is needed because democracy, power, and courage are almost gone. And the city of Durham has an excellent opportunity to show not just North Carolina, not just the US South, not just the country, but the world that it is dedicated toward radical freedom for all people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bryant. <laughs> Scott Barish. Uh, good evening, uh, esteemed council. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Uh, my name is Scott Barish, and I'm here to speak on behalf of Participatory Budgeting Durham in support of funding participatory budgeting in Durham, and specifically at the level of $2.5 million with $250,000 for implementation. Aaron uh, gave some excellent uh, remarks about why participatory budgeting is so imp would be so impactful for the city. Um, it is an important tool in our toolkit to be able to create a more just and equitable Durham that I know everyone on this council wants to build. Uh, and it is a way for us to expand democracy and include those who have been excluded from the process uh, for far too long. But those commitments are meaningless if we do not put our money where our mouth is and commit to a level of funding that will allow people to make decisions that will actually lead to material benefits in their lives and real change that makes their lives better. So this is why we're asking for two and a half million dollars. It is only 0.64% of the city's annual budget, and it, but it is enough to be able to inspire people to make the kinds of decisions about how to improve our communities collectively. And uh, we would like to move this proposal forward, uh, specifically at this funding level, so that we can ensure that this is a just and equitable process, and that, uh, because if we do not adequately fund it, we will find that, once again, the voices who are too often at the table that are now too often white and male will be the voices at the table for participatory budgeting. So when we commit enough funds, we will begin to see uh, our, we will actually be able to live out our values of expanding democracy and making this a more equitable city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barish. <laughs> Danielle Purefoy, and I'll get to you in a minute, Ms. Faison. Oh, yep, you're, you're next, you're last. Come on up, Ms. Purefoy. Thank you. Good evening to the council and thank you for listening. My name is Danielle Purifoy and I'm here on behalf of Durham Beyond Policing, a campaign focused on building an alternative public safety system for our city. I'm here to talk specifically about the public safety budget, 60% of which was devoted this year to funding the police department. This year, over 60 million of the $100 million public safety, $100 million public safety budget was spent on the police, in addition to $71 million borrowed for the new police headquarters. And yet 85% of the crimes committed in Durham this past year were properly, property related in the three quarters of this current fiscal year. So the problem in our city, as we have said persistently and many times we've been before you, is not a crisis of morality or violence. It is a problem rather of structural poverty and racism none of which are resolvable by the police. And in fact, the police 
as we've also said, have been agents in contributing to these problems. And we've seen this manifested in many ways, including the skyrocketing eviction crisis, increasing homelessness and displacement of our communities, and through lack of investment in the communities that need it the most. The public police budget was increased by 4.3%, or $2.6 million last year. So what we did was we got together in our campaign and thought a little bit about how we could redistribute that funding in ways that do keep us safe across six main categories. We allocated $370,000 for restorative justice programs in schools which have been um, uh, defunded in recent months. $680,000 to support jail diversion programs, $225,000 to support emergency responders besides police, including people who could help with mental health crises be better than police could, $600,000 to support a small pilot program for universal basic income, as had been piloted in Stockton, California, $600,000 to su further support the rehabilitation of housing and other housing-related programs, and $200,000 to support a youth for workforce. This is just the beginning of what we could do to build a new paradigm around public safety in our city. There's been a lot of discussion lately in the media about the ways in which the city government is hamstrung by the larger state government. While we are excited about the prospect of participatory budgeting in our city, there's even more that we can do. And here, as we presented, is another example of how the council could use the power it does have to keep us truly safe. Thank you. Uh, Marie Hill uh, Faison, nice to see you. Mayor Schuler. Yes, ma'am. City Council, thank you. I wasn't prepared to come and speak this evening. I came to support the uh, city workers, and then I realized that I need to get up here and talk about the work that I do here in the city. And uh, I work for the Data Access Paratransit, and I think you are familiar with that service. And um, I, I would like to have this budget approved so that when we have issues like compression and uh, longevity and things of that nature that affects our work, our workers, that we would be considered in that budget. Because like some of the city workers here explained, there, there are a lot of loopholes here that are missing. And uh, this $15 uh, increase that is, is going to be um, implemented is uh, pushing some of the drivers that have been there for years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years. And those are important people uh, that are, um, bring experience to their job and they should be compensated for it. And those, uh, that budget that uh, we're asking for could definitely uh, suit that purpose. So I thought it was good that I got up here and, and I represent um, Teamsters Local 391. And uh, what my issues were that uh, we do have contracts and things of that nature, but um, this is something that had been done in the, in the past and we should honor it and have that compression uh, honored too. So I just thought I'd come up here and, and speak for the drivers. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Faison. Let me thank you very much to those who have spoken so far. Is there anyone else before I close this public hearing that would like to be heard for three minutes on the budget? Is there anyone else who would like to speak? We very much appreciate everyone who came, and everyone spoke very well, and I want to tell you all that we were all listening very carefully uh, and really appreciate your input on the budget. Um, any comments by members of the council before I close the public hearing? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed, and I want to thank everyone for uh, coming out for it tonight. Thank you Mr. very Mayor, much. Can I ask uh, Ms. Johnson just to, for the public's benefit, uh, quickly uh, talk about the rest of the budget process? I'll be presenting the final budget to the council, I believe, May 21st. May 21st. The manager will present the budget on May 21st at the Monday night city council meeting. We will have then have another public hearing on the actual proposed budget on June 4th. 
which is a Monday night meeting. All right, and then the council would consider the final budget June? Uh, June 18th. Thank you. Be the night of the adoption of the budget. Just want to clarify that for the record. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Johnson. All righty, we will now move to the next public hearing item, uh, which is Item 16, Revisions to Design Commitments for Arrington 2. Thank you. Good evening. Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. All planning items in front of you tonight have been properly noticed and advertised in accordance with law, and affidavits are on file in the Planning Office to that effect. The City Council approved a zoning map change and development plan for Arrington 2 on January 3rd, 2011. This is Legacy Case Z0900015. This is a 95.6 acre tract of land located east of Page Road in the southeast portion of Durham, just west of the Wake County boundary. The legacy case called for mixed use zoning with a development plan and stipulated a maximum of 1,550,000 square feet of office, retail, and commercial uses, along with over, a mil over excuse me, along with over 1,000 residential dwellings. A number of site plans have been approved for that area and construction is underway for the residential development. The applicant, Jonathan Parsons of J. Davis, is requesting some minor revisions to the, develop, to the, to the design commitments. If, if approved, the changes will allow the developer some flexibility with regard to the materials and the design of non-residential buildings and signs. No changes are being made to the rest of the development plan. Per the Unified Development Ordinance, any revision to the design commitments are considered a significant change and require a new hearing and recommendation from the Planning Commission prior to the case being heard by the City Council. The Durham Planning Commission at their January 9, 2018 meeting recommended approval of the proposed by a vote of 10 to 0. Staff determines that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies ordinances. Two motions are required for this application. The first is, re is required to adopt a consistency statement and the second is required for the zoning ordinance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Sunyak. You have heard the staff report. I'm going to declare this public hearing open and I'm gonna first ask if there are any questions or comments by members of the council. Any questions or comments by members of the council? All right, if not, uh, we have three members of the public who have, uh, who have signed up to speak. Jonathan Parsons, Robert Schunk, and Ken Spaulding. Um, oh, that's South Point Automark. I'm sorry, I only have one for Abingdon. I apologize. I have one person to sign up to speak for, uh, for uh, Arrington 2, and that is Jonathan Parsons. Mr. Parsons, are you here? Great. Is there anyone else that would like to speak on this matter? Not the, not the other two matters that I got to speak with, mixed up with. Anyone that would like to speak on Arrington 2? Any, or anyone either for or against, proponents or opponents? All righty. Mr. Parsons, uh, you have three minutes, sir. Well, my name is Jonathan Parsons. I'm representing the client as the agent for this property. Um, I'm really just here to answer questions as the staff is well summarized, this process was really about just clarifying the language to allow us a little bit more flexibility in our material placement, but we are maintaining the quality of the development with the materials proposed. We still have the same compos composition, same elements. We've just clarified the text, and that's really what this is about. Thank you very much, Mr. Parsons. Are there any questions for the applicant? Any comments or questions by members of the council? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed. Do I have a motion on the item? We leave, I believe we need two mo uh, motions on this item. The first will be to adopt a consistency statement. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt a consistency statement. Madam Clerk, will you please <coughs> open the vote? Close the vote.
Motion passes 6-0. Thank you. Uh, now we'll need a motion to adopt an ordinance amending the, amending the United, uh, Unified Development Ordinance. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Again, motion passes 6-0. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. All righty, we'll now move to item 17, consolidated item for page part two. Good evening, Jamie Sonyak with the Planning Department. Request to amend a previously approved future land use map amendment and zoning map change have been received from Robert Schunk Stewart, Inc. This application involves the original page park development which is P03-20. It was approved by City Council on October 6, 2003. At that time, the track was zoned for residential suburban multifamily with a development plan with a mix of residential and commercial land uses broken into three areas. A portion of the site included 288 apartments, which is currently under construction. The applicant currently proposes to change a portion of the development identified as 4801 Crown Parkway or Track B on the development plan to residential suburban multifamily with a development plan, RSMD, in order to construct 50 townhouses where the previously approved development plan permitted 29,100 square feet of retail. The applicant is also seeking a comprehensive plan amendment request to change the future land use map designation from commercial to low medium density residential to correspond with this request. The Durham Planning Commission at their December 12th, 2017 meeting recommended approval of the proposed by a vote of 13 to zero. Staff determines that this request, that these requests are consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions are required for this application. The first is required to adopt a resolution amending the uh, future land use map designation. The second is to adopt a consistency statement, and the third is for the zoning ordinance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Sunyak. You've heard the staff report. I'm going to declare this public hearing open. And first, I'm going to ask if there are any questions or comments from members of the council. Any questions or comments for staff at this point? All right, thank you. Uh, and now I have one member of the public signed up for this, uh, Robert Schunk. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak on this item? Is there anyone else that would like to speak on the consolidated item for page part two, either proponents or opponents? All righty, thank you. And Mr. Schunk, you have three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening and mayors, members of city council. Good evening, I, I am uh, Robert Schunk. I live at uh, 2627 University Drive here in the Rockwood community of Durham. Uh, staff did a great job um, reviewing the project that is here before you this evening, and we would certainly appreciate your support of the project. I'm here accompanied with uh, George Stanziel, Erica Latham, and Tim Legend, and uh, we're here, here to uh, answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sean. Are there questions or comments at this point by members of the council? Anyone? Questions or comments? I have some questions, Mr. Sean. Is there anyone else that have any? I'm sorry, uh, Council Member Caballero. Uh, I'm just looking at attachment nine from the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advising, Advisory Commission, and I was just wondering, um, that was not listed in the staff report, and if there's any resolution to that request. Sure, the, the two comments speak to a crosswalk being mm -hmm. added there at Crown Parkway, and that'll be included in the site plan. Okay. Um, and then the other request was a four foot bike lane, and when the project was uh, built and constructed back in 2006, the, time, at the, the standard at the time was to build a 14-foot outside wide lane, and that has been constructed. And it's customary that if there's no other uh, road improvements being requested, being, uh, there's no other turn lanes to build at this time, that we'll, um, we just leave the 14-foot bike lane. 14-foot bike lane? 14-foot outside lane that has extra room for a bike lane. So a standard typical lane is 11 feet, sometimes 12 feet. So the 14 provides the extra room for the bicyclists. Thank you. Would that be striped? You may not know the answer to that question. Mr. Judge might know the answer to that question. It is not striped. It's not striped. 
Could it be striped? Would we want it to be striped? Bill Judge, transportation. No, uh, the state will not allow it to be striped unless it's at least four feet wide. And so. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, Mr. Schunk, uh, thank you for the proffer for Durham Public Schools. I appreciate that proffer, uh, the inclusion of that. Uh, have you decided to uh, honor my request to name the roads after King Lear's daughters? Yes. Okay, good. I think if we're going to have a King Lear street, we need to have the other streets named after King Lear's daughters. I'll be out to check on that. Thank you. Um, the, the price point of the townhomes, could you let me know what that, that is? Uh, just over 200000 less than two twenty five. Okay, thank you. That is a price point that we need in Durham, and I'm glad to hear that you all are building at that price point. Uh, there's no affordable housing proffer here. Um, we've discussed that. Uh, Ms. Latham, you have uh, talked about uh, bringing us some ideas on affordable housing. Would you mind coming to the podium? Thank you. When last we met, uh, we discussed uh, here, uh, I asked you all about that, and I appreciated you coming back uh, with the, the thought that you would have some ideas to offer on affordable housing uh, from Lennar and, and, and potentially some other developers that you would talk to. And I was wondering, uh, what would you, you know, how do you think that, that we might hear from you all on that or in what kind of time frame? Well, that's a good question. I'm going to a meeting with, no, I'm sorry, am I too close? To a meeting with the Council of Governments next month uh, to talk about some comprehensive policies that involve not only the builders and the apartment builders in Durham, but also financial partners as well as municipal government partners. So give us a couple months to brainstorm and put some ideas together. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. I look forward Thank to you. hearing back on that. That's a very important and appreciate your leadership. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Any other questions or comments by members of the council? If not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed. And uh, we have asked for a motion on this item. Uh, we looks like we need three different motions. Okay, I'll move to adopt the resolution amending the future land use map to low medium density residential for the subject site. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Mr. Mayor, I'll move to adopt a consistency statement as required by state statute. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Six zero, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, I'll move to adopt an ordinance amending the Unified Development Ordinance as specified in the agenda. Is there a second? Second. second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the ordinance. Uh, is there any discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Six zero, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. All righty. Uh, thank you all very much. And we'll now move to item 18, zoning map change for park at South Point 2. Ms. Sunyak? Oh, I'm sorry, Jacob. Mr. Wiggins? Apologize. No problem. I've been called worse things. <laughs> um, Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. Um, there's a request in front of you from Mr. Robert Schunk to change the future land use map and also change the zoning atlas for nine parcels generally located um, east of NC 751 and north of Interstate 40, located along South Point Auto Park Boulevard. Um, the subject site is currently designated, uh, I'm sorry, currently designated as office and medium density residential on the future land use map. And the site is currently zoned um, office and institutional 
residential suburban multifamily, and commercial general with a development plan. Mr. Chunk is proposing to have the site designated as commercial on the future land use map and have the site zoned as commercial general with a development plan. Some key commitments on the development plan include a maximum of 55,000 square feet for an auto sales use, um, a prohibition on outdoor paging systems in the vehicle sales area, increased project boundary buffers along for a portion of the site, as well as 70% maximum impervious surfaces. The Durham Planning Commission at their January 8th, 2018 meeting recommended approval of this request by a vote of 10 to zero. Um, I also note in the staff report on page one, there was a typo on there that said that the Planning Commission um, did not support this item. So my apologies for that. I assure you they voted 10 to nothing on this item. And then finally staff recommends um, or determines that this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and applicable policies and ordinances. Three motions and three votes will be required. One for the future land use map designation, one for the consistency statement, and then finally the zoning ordinance. And I'm happy to answer any questions the council may have at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Wiggins. You've heard the report from staff. I'm gonna declare this public hearing open. And first I wanna ask if there are any questions or comments from members of the council. I have a question. Mr. Well, Freeman. Just, just recognizing the, um, this is the Honda Crown, okay. The site that this is at, I noticed the landscaping was a lot more in detail, like very, um, can't think of the word, but, um, but there was a big difference from on the other side, on Fedville Street, I wanna say, there's another dealership. Are you, um, oh yeah, the Hendrick South Point below the mall? Yeah. The area? Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to know if, how that happened, where there's like such great landscaping and the frontage towards the street, and then on this one, well, on the other, there isn't. I, which one are you referring to as the, the prime Hendrix. example, the Hendrix site? Yeah, I, I, my assumption is the differentiation there was different zoning ordinances and different codes and regulations at the time. The existing South Point Auto Park Mall um, mm -hmm. is a little over 10 years old, if I recall. Um, so the differences um, in the ordinances were probably a result of some of those landscaping requirements. It also could have been an aesthetic choice by the developer. Okay. Have they changed in the 10 years? Um, has our landscaping requirements changed? Um, there have been some changes over time. I don't know what those exact changes are off the top of my head. I apologize. I would like to, to um, sure. yes, ma'am. have a list of what has changed just to, just to kind of keep track because it does seem quite um, inequitable how there's so much landscaping on one site and then the other there's hardly, I mean, mainly it's just grass, like just grass front frontage. Sure. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, council member. All righty, any more comments or questions from members of the council at this point? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Council member Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. One of the planning commissioners in the written comments made reference to a proffer that was made um, at the planning commission. Do you have any information about that? Yes, sir, Councilman Reese, uh, Jacob Wiggins again with the Planning Department. I would direct your attention to the development plan. Um, that would be the fourth commitment. Um, so it wasn't a true proffer that was proffered at the hearing, but the developer did indicate that, that they would provide a commitment at this stage. That they'll be providing that commitment tonight. And they, yeah, and they have. It, it's on the plan. It was um, something that was discussed at the hearing, and the developer at the hearing indicated that they would make a commitment prior to this item coming before you. Jacob, for the record, can you go ahead and clarify what that is now that we've raised that issue? Yes, sir. Um, so the commitment is as follows. Uh, prior to the issuance of a certificate of compliance, the developer shall provide a single row of evergreen trees and or evergreen understory trees that will be installed um, eight feet on center and installed at a minimum height of eight feet, or I'm sorry, as six feet as shown on the development plan. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Wiggins. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for staff at this time? All righty. Uh, if not, we have one person who signed up to speak on this, Kenneth Spaulding. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak on this matter as either a proponent or opponent of South Point Auto Park 2? All righty, Mr. Stanzi, I'll thank you. Uh, anyone else that would like to speak? 
Okay, Mr. Spaulding, you have three minutes. Welcome. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Ken Spaulding. I represent the applicant. Uh, as was stated, we are seeking a plan amendment and rezoning of our property from a mixture of uses, which are office and uh, multifamily, to commercial. This property is immediately adjacent to our currently existing auto park, which is commercial, uh, and consists of the Lexus dealership and the uh, Honda dealership. And through our current that we already have um, uh, zone, uh, we have a place that will uh, be housing a new business, Durham, and that will be the uh, Volvo dealership. And uh, that will provide an opportunity for um, enhancing the tax base and, and, and helping us with uh, additional jobs. Uh, in essence, what we are seeking is to expand our current footprint. Uh, however, under the current office and multifamily, the property has remained dormant for over a decade. Our proposal is flanked by our auto park to the south and significant Army Corps of Engineers properties was pointed out uh, to the north. We had uh, two neighborhood meetings uh, for the neighbors and that <coughs> adjacent to our proposal. Our proposal does lower traffic and lower school enrollment. I believe the traffic is lowered by about 858 um, trips and the enrollment, I believe, 23 uh, students. Staff has presented their favorable review uh, we are consistent with our city's plans and policies as laid out by staff in their report this evening. And we did receive a planning commission vote unanimous of 10 to 0. Uh, we thusly respectfully request your support as well, which will allow this vacant and overgrown property to be put to its best use and consistency as aforementioned. And I think Mr. Stanziel just wanted a clarification. Thank you, Mr. Spaulding. Mr. Stanziel. Thank you, George Stanziel, uh, 115 Cofield Circle in Durham. Ms. Freeman, thank you for bringing up the landscape treatment. That was not a, a result of, of the ordinances at the time. That was a very, very significant uh, commitment by the developer to, to do that, that treatment uh, along 751. I think it was somewhere in the half million dollar range in terms of landscape and the walls, the stone walls that you see out there. So he has made a very significant commitment. And then if you drive down the, uh, the uh, parkway that goes back to Honda, you'll see in the medians significant landscape as well as street trees, that uh, oaks that, that line the, the, uh, the streets going all the way down that, that uh, parkway. So. It was a significant commitment on the part of the developer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stanzial. Are there any other speakers on this item? If not, I'll ask members of the council if they have any questions or comments at this point. Just, just Council Member Freeman. Uh -huh. I, I appreciate you sharing that information. I think it's it's important to highlight that as a developer, over 10 years ago, making an investment in the community around landscaping and street trees and how it's paid off thus far for the city is important to note and just making sure that that's um, thank you thank you for that comment i agree thank you any other comments or questions by members of the council um, i will just comment that i think this is the appropriate use at the appropriate spot so good uh, any other comments or questions if not, I'm going to declare this public hearing closed and the matter is back before the council. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion to adopt a resolution amending the future land use map uh, to establish commercial as the site's designation. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. Motion passes 6-0. Thank you. Mayor, I'll move to adopt a consistency statement as required by state statute. Second. It's been moved and seconded to that we adopt a consistency statement. Any discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, please open the vote. Close the vote. 6-0, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. 
Mr. Mayor, I'd move to adopt an ordinance amending the Unified Development Ordinance as set forth in the agenda. Okay. It's been moved and seconded that we adopt the ordinance. Any discussion? If not, Madam Clerk, will you please open the vote? Close the vote. 6-0. Thank you very much. Well, that concludes that item and all the public hearing items. I don't believe there's any more business to come before this body. If not, I will declare this meeting adjourned at 8-18. Thank you very much, council members. I appreciate you some time tonight, Mr. Mayor.